Welcome to Point Church. My name is Mackenzie, and we're excited to have you join us today. If you don't know, Point Church is a family of churches around the state that are all about pointing people to Jesus. If you're interested in learning more about us, head on over to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with sermons, worship videos, and more by going to pointchurch.com YouTube. As we prepare to sing and worship, take a second to calm your heart. Consider how Jesus came and died for your brokenness, your shortcomings, your sin, and was raised so we could experience new life in a relationship with him. He paid the penalty for us so that we could walk in freedom. May that fill you with joy and hope as we worship today.
Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Yeah. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. So it is our grand opening, and we are so glad that you are here with us. Uh, this is our third try in a few weeks, but I, I have to take you back a little bit further than that, though. Uh, we started meeting together the first Sunday of March of last year. Now, that first Sunday of March, this place looked a lot different. Um, it was still beautiful, but it was uh, dated, we'll say. Um, and there was myself and my wife and I think maybe seven or eight other folks here. Uh, and so we've come a long ways. And we want to invite you, though, and I know it's already been mentioned and it's going to be mentioned again, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it one more time. We want to invite you to give us five, okay? Now, what that means is, if you've heard, it, you've heard Rob talk about it, give us five tries. Come see us five times, and if, if there's not the place for you, then we'll help you find a new home. But I, I do want to encourage you that if, if your goal, if your life goal is to reach Johnson County and, and share Jesus with people, this is a good place to do it. All right, we're, we're looking to build something for the kingdom right here, and I'm excited that you have chosen to be here with us this morning. We are deeply, deeply honored that you are with us. I promise you that. Now, because we've been meeting for a little bit, we're actually in Sermon 3 of a series. So you're, you're tuning in like a lot of us guys like to do to a program already in progress, right guys? Uh, we're tuning in to a program already in progress but you can check those out on our Facebook page. If you'll find us, those are there. So we're going to be in 1 John this morning. If you want to turn over there, if you don't have your Bible, that's cool. The Word's going to be up here with us this morning. Uh, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2 in just a moment. But I will tell you, as a preacher, as a pastor, however you want to put it, uh, there are parts of people's lives that we are, are privy to. There are things that we experience with people that can be tough sometimes, and, and honestly, you know, they can be heavy to bear, and, and that's okay because that's part of the job, right? That's part of the, that's what we signed up for. But then there are those really amazing parts, right? Like, for one, uh, you get to be there. You're typically one of the first non-family members to hold a newborn baby, right? That's pretty cool. As, as a pastor, you get to do that. Um, my favorite thing by far, though, probably is weddings. I love weddings, and it's not just the cake or the punch, uh, which, which we've actually got some frozen punch in our freezer right now. Who else loves wedding punch, right? Okay, I'm not alone. But it, it is that bringing together, it's, it's being with two people who are there to honor God and become one. Now, part of getting married here, especially in the South, we have traditions. You may have heard this one before. Something old. There you go. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Now, according to my deep detective work, meaning I Googled it, something old, 
stands for continuity. Something new shows optimism for the future. Something borrowed symbolizes borrowed happiness. And something blue represents purity, love, and fidelity. So I'm going to use that this morning. And as we draw our attention to 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 14, we're going to look at something old, something new, but this is where it gets clever, something foundational, and something true. Move over, Dr. Zeus. All right. <laughs> Verse 7, here we go. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning the commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him. There is no cause for stumbling. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Verse 12, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Before we go any further, let's just take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for your word. Just the fact that you gave us your word is such an awesome thing. And God, this morning I pray as you speak to us, and we know you will because you promise your word will not return void, that we will respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all say it. Amen. Amen. So, as we get into our passage this morning, we're just going to take a moment, just a quick little backstory to remind us who our writer is. Now, we're in 1 John, so it's obvious, obviously probably a guy named what? John, that is correct. It's John. But which John are we talking about? This is John, the beloved disciple, uh, one of the inner circle of Jesus, uh, often called, you know, one of, he's one of the sons of thunder. But he's also known for his friendship to Jesus. And we said a, a couple of weeks ago that at the cross it was him who uh, Jesus pointed to and, and basically gave him charge over his mother, Mary. Additionally, we know that John was a better runner than Peter. Um, he was a better runner. He beat him to the tomb. And now he's writing uh, one of three epistles, three letters, if you will, to the newly birthed church on topics that are just as relevant today in Johnson County as the day that the ink was still wet. So by way of unpacking this from my note takers, the first thing we're going to look at this morning, as promised, is something old, something old. Oh, verse 7 said, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Now, if you've been around me uh, previously, uh, some of you guys know that I am a Lord of the Rings fan. Any other Lord of the Rings fans in the house this morning? Big, big fan, Lord of the Rings. That's right. Love Tolkien and, and Lewis and, and just all that awesomeness. And there, there's a quote from the Fellowship of the Rings book, and it made its way into the movie. And it goes like this. And I bet some of you are, are nerdy enough like me that you can complete the... T as soon as I start saying it, you'll start saying it in your head. I can't say it in her voice, I'm sorry. It goes like this, and some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend, legend became myth. Anybody remember that saying from the books and the movies? So by the time Jesus is on the scene and incarnate and walking in shoe leather, that is exactly where we find the Jewish people. Some things that should have been remembered were lost. Some things that like, you know, mercy and grace <laughs> had been lost. But instead, they had expanded the law in such a manner that it pretty much absolutely made certain that the moment your feet hit the floor in the morning, you were going to sin. All 
right? The law had been expanded to a point the lawyers had taken heritage and made the law the central focus of what it meant to be a God follower. They had taken 613 Mosaic laws and expanded those into an impossible system. It's against that backdrop that Jesus is challenged by a group of lawyers. Now, we're going to look in Matthew 22 in just a moment, but remember, John is there witnessing this in Matthew. He is, in fact, we talked about that in our first message, uh, manifest. You know, he, he talks about what we've seen, what we've heard. We're, we're making it known to you. We're being witnesses of the things that we saw happen. So, if you will, if you want to flip over to Matthew 22, you can, or you can look up here in just a moment. Uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter this morning, but just so we know what's going on, in verses 1 through 14, uh, Jesus has taught the parable of the wedding feast. In verses 15 through 22, he challenges the listeners to be responsible about paying their taxes. Could have done without that one, Jesus, to be real honest, right? If we're honest. And then in uh, verses 22 through 32, he confirms the resurrection, uh, which isn't that awesome. We have from the mouth of Jesus, from God in the flesh, confirmation that the resurrection is real. And we can have hope in the resurrection. But then we get the verses 34 through 40. And the Pharisees, they'd already seen that Jesus had put the Sadducees in their place and so they decide, we're going to try to trap him. We're going to trap him and get him tangled up. If we can get him tangled up as it relates to the law, we've got him. So we pick it up in chapter 22, verses 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced, I love this, he silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. I can picture them off over in the corner, right? They're off over in the corner and they're talking. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commands depend all the law and prophets. This was a mic drop moment for Jesus. Okay, a mic drop moment. The greatest commandment, he said, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And, and John is referring to that in this passage. It's, it's not new, but it is true. We are to love the Lord our God. But what does it mean? What does it mean to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul? It means, and if you're writing things down, you, it's not going to be on the screen, but you may want to write it down. I'm going to go kind of slow. Jesus must be the central figure of our lives. Jesus must be the central figure of our lives. He said to them, and in, 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 as we look at the commandments, remember, thou shalt have no other gods before me. When I think about Jesus being the central figure of our lives, I think about a wheel, right? Have you ever had a, a wheel before that gets off the axle? Anybody that ever happened to you before? You might have been behind somebody in Johnson County riding down the road like that, right? It's a bumpy ride. It doesn't work real well when the wheel is not rotating around the axle like it's supposed to. It's a bumpy ride. Guess what? It's an even bumpier ride when that's the way our lives are. When Jesus is not the central figure of our lives. Now, the good news is you're, you're here this morning. So you're saying, hey, I want Jesus to be the central figure in my, my life. But we all know that that is a very real struggle, right? Especially as, as we live in this, this American church, in this American culture, and we're we're tempted to chase after all the stuff that the Jones have down the street, right? Sorry if your last name's Jones. But we're, we're tempted, right, to, to make those things the priority. It's one of our greatest struggles. There's nothing wrong with pursuing hobbies. Hobbies are good. I'm thinking of taking back up fly fishing this spring. Anybody fly fish? Um, fun, fun stuff. Um, working hard is okay if, if, if it's in this right place. And we should definitely... Love our families. But who sits on the throne of our hearts? And you're going to hear me say that a lot because I'll, I'll tell you, 
the reality is, and I discovered this in my own life, this Christian walk is really all about who's on the throne of our hearts. The things we struggle with every day, it's who are we yielding to? Are we yielding to Christ? Or are we yielding to our flesh? Number two, something new. So verse 8 says, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So what was the new commandment? We, we read about it a moment ago. It was to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, Because 19, Israelite in your heart, rebuke, rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But then it says, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Well, Jesus, when he comes along, he obliterates the need for 613 commandments. He obliterates it. Now, I'm glad because I don't know about you, but I have a hard time with two. Right? 613, that, that's, that is hard. And if we are honest, some of us grew up in environments where it felt like we had 613, right? And, and we couldn't obey them. But as an aside, allow me to point this out. This is one of those, this is one of those moments, um, I'm just, this one's free, okay? We're just going to kind of step over here. This one's free. I'm not charging you all for this one, Okay. Even though Jesus obliterated the law, if you will, he fulfilled it, technically, is what he did, and, and gave us the two to focus on. From time to time, I'll run into people, and they'll, be, they'll say, well, you know what, the Old Testament, we don't need that anymore, because Jesus fulfilled all that, we don't need that. I strongly disagree. And I, I want you to consider this. It's a book of the past, yes, but it's a book of poetry. Looking at Psalms, right? It's a book of principles for living. Proverbs, 31 of them bad boys take one a day. All right? And in February, you can pick, all right, a few extra ones. Prophecies, you know, some which haven't been fulfilled yet, like in the book of Daniel. Um, and people we should know, like Deborah, who was amazing, or, or Samson. And, and, and it even gives us the purpose of why Jesus came. In Galatians 3.24, Paul writes it this way. He says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. It was the guardrails like you see out there on Highway 40 where they're building. In order that we might be justified by faith. The law was always intended to be a schoolmaster. It was intended to teach us this very important thing that we cannot justify ourselves. That's what it was ultimately there for. But now... Jesus puts loving God on par with loving others. And if you think about it, that is absolutely brilliant. Because if we're honest, if we're honest, there's no one we love more than ourselves. Right? If we're honest. I mean, yes, we love our family, we love our kids, and, and, and so on, but, but we, we really, you know, in fact, a lot of the things we get into, a lot of the trouble, if you will, we get into in our relationships is because we love ourselves. I feel like I'm meddling now, I'm sorry. But it starts with a simple question. How can I put other people first? Like, when you wake up every day, if you're going to fulfill what John is talking about in John, 1 John chapter 2 and what Jesus was telling the Pharisees in Matthew 22, it starts with a simple question. How can I put other people first? And who's my neighbor? Well, look around you. Your neighbor. Everyone that you encounter is your neighbor. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later on. Verse 8 says this, and I love this. He says, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. I love that. And the true light is already shining. So, so here is the challenge. The challenge for us is that, and, and John's calling our attention to this, is that we can't, as, as men and women, love properly without the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
I'll tell you, I'll, I'll just be very honest with you, and if it scares you away, I'm sorry, but without the Holy Spirit in my life every day, I know who I would be. I was expelled from public school, okay? Not suspended, expelled. I wasn't a believer yet, but I know. And so I, I, every day, man, like Romans 12.1, like every single day, I'm praying Romans 12.1 giving myself as a living sacrifice because I know me. And you're probably sitting there going, I know me, right? I love this. He says, the darkness is passing away. You know, here's the thing. We, we have ado- adopted, as our saying here, and if you've looked at, it on, at us all on Facebook, you've seen it. And Rob, will you stand up for us? All right, turn around and show everybody your beautiful shirt. You can flex if you want. Um, Thank you. Um, Joko needs Jesus has become our our thing. That's our mantra, right, is Joko needs Jesus. And and it does. We know the statistics of how many people are not in a house of God this morning. But here's the thing. The way they're going to meet Jesus is through you. And and it's going to be through the love that you and I show them on the day-to-day. And, and honestly, the community around us, as hard as they build new things, it's a sinking ship. Darkness is passing away. Satan is already a defeated foe. We're going to talk in a couple of weeks about this world system, but, but people are, are like, literally, it's like they're on the Titanic, and they're grabbing anything they can. You and I have the answer. Number three. Something foundational. Something foundational. Verse 9 says this, Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. I mean, I could stop right there, right? That is heavy. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You may have heard it said before that repetition is the mother of all learning, right? John was all about repetition. John repeats himself quite a bit, which that's a, that's a Hebrew way of teaching, to repeat a lesson again and again. And some things he's so serious about that he says them again. So like over in chapter 4, verse 20, he says it again. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. I mean, he's like, in case you didn't get it, let me lay it down for you. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Let's let's, let's have some real talk, though. We know that the reality is we are not going to like everyone that we encounter, right? Sometimes we're just going to rub each other the wrong way. It's just, it happens. But we're called to love. There are two reasons that people don't like other people. That one, one commentator said it this way. Number one, they have a habit or they've done something to us, all right? If they have a habit, we probably just need to be patient, right? Because we probably have a habit too, right? But then there, there's reality that there, there are people who've done things to us. Like, there, there are legitimately people who have injured us in our lives. There are family members who have legitimately hurt us and are toxic even. And, and really, it's difficult for us to be around. I would say to you this morning, and we can have a talk over this over coffee if you want, but John's not saying that it's not okay to set healthy boundaries. Okay? That's not what he's saying. In fact, Psalm 1320, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So boundaries are okay, but what he is saying is we cannot hate other people. Forgive. Yes. Boundaries. Okay. But we can't hate. I'm going to show you why in a minute. Number two, then there are people that we dislike For no reason. 
And here's what I mean. We've been predisposed to distrust, maybe dislike based on race or socioeconomic factors and so on. John had zero patience for that in his writing. And the fact is, neither should we. Let me try that again. (laughs) He had zero patience and neither should we. I will proclaim to you boldly this morning, there is but one race, there is the human race. And there is but one blood and one baptism in Christ, period. We have a responsibility to be Jesus to people. Now, gang, what, what, I'm, what I'm, I want us to understand is that doesn't mean that we don't tell the truth to people who are living in sin. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we, we rubber stamp people's sins and say, that's okay, that's, you know, that's just your thing. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we're going to draw people with love. And if you'll notice that Jesus, I mean, if, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesus is supposed to be our example, right? Who did he go to? The people no one else would go to. He went out of his way to have a conversation with a woman who was like somebody that your mama would have told you, don't you talk to her, right? And that ethnically was someone he shouldn't as a rabbi been talking to. He went out of his way to speak with her. So we have to be mindful of that. And I would challenge us, we're going to challenge us in a moment to think more about that. But again, it doesn't mean that we're going to comfort people in their sin, but it means that we need to have compassion. Because if not for God, it could be us. We also need to be aware that not loving our neighbor or harboring hatred ultimately has, number three, an impact on us. Verse 10 says, there's no cause for stumbling, but whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Here's the deal. You can be right in every other area of your life, right? And that's what we do, right? We have a list of, well, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, so I'm good. But if we're harboring hatred for a a brother or sister or even a people group that we've never met or someone we don't know, that root of bitterness will become poison and destroy the whole body. The classical biblical example is Saul. Saul was jealous of David, tried to impale him. My man was just sitting over there playing his Martin guitar, right? He was just playing some Willie Nelson, just doing his thing. And, and, and Saul tried to impale him. He was so jealous, he had lost sight of the fact that he was the problem. He became so hateful toward him that he was filled with bitterness. Like here's the reality: there's always going to be somebody that gets on your nerves. All right, Amen. I mean, if you drive around Raleigh, there's going to be somebody that gets on your nerves. I mean, I'm just going to be honest, right? I got behind somebody yesterday. I was like, God help me, <laughs> you know, please. There's always going to be somebody who's more blessed than you, at least it looks like. There's going to be somebody who, you know, at work who advances faster than you or, or as, you know, sometimes as preachers, you know, a better communicator, right? There's always going to be that person, no matter, we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. You cannot, we cannot hate our brother or another and walk in light, if we have something against them, it ultimately impacts us. It poisons every relationship. Number four, something true. Verse 12 says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. As we begin to wrap this up, John speaks to a few different groups. First, number one, he speaks to children. He names children for a few reasons. Uh, One, he's referring to spiritual children. 
you know, these, these people that he were, was writing to, they ultimately were John and the other disciples. He considered them their spiritual children. But I think another way he's using this is to receive it as children, right? Think about kids, right? Kids, kids are awesome, right? Kids are amazing. They're innocent, and they, they, they just they soak it all in, right? They're just fascinated by the world. That is what John's talking about. Saying to receive my words as a child. Receive my words as a child. He writes to fathers because these fathers had literally seen Jesus. Many of them had actually seen him at work. And because fathers have a responsibility to be leaders in the faith. There should be a really big amen there. Let me try that again. Um, fathers have responsibility to be leaders in the faith. And I'll tell you guys, let me just talk to the fellas for just a moment, okay? Here's the thing. We talked about it a while ago, trying to keep up with the Jones and all that. The enemy is brilliant. And we're going to talk about that, love not the world, coming up like in a few weeks. The enemy is brilliant. It's like he's in a boxing ring with us, right? And he's fainting. He's like fainting. He's like getting us distracted so he can like hit us with a right hook. And that's what he does. He gets us so focused. And look, I've been there, right? Even in ministry, I've been there. At a, I, there was a point in my life at which I was so focused on doing ministry that I was not doing the things I needed to do in my own household. And God had to fix that. So I want to challenge guys this morning heed John's words. Be the leader God has given us to be. Now, that looks like something quite different than what the world tries to tell us it does. And we'll talk about that probably next week. So you see, you got to come back. Because if you don't come back, you're not going to know. You're just, you're going to have half the information. He says, young men, young men, because it's in the energy, it's in that energy of young men that the gospel is shared. Uh, young men are full of energy, right? Uh, if you get a group of young men together, it's not long before they've come up with a game of their own. They're wrestling. They're, they have, they're full of energy. If you could bottle that energy and sell it, wow, right? So that is the, that's, that's the spirit in which he's talking about. And, and it's because at that time, you know, young men were the ones who fought wars and, and were the ground troops. So he addresses them that way. Allow me to address the elephant in the room. It's obvious here that John does not mention ladies, mothers, women. But remember, this is a cultural thing. He's, his intent is not to diminish women in any way. Uh, it's important to get that the Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. Okay? Now, here's what I mean by that. When John wrote that, he's writing it to a specific group of people, specifically here Jewish people, and so he's writing in Jewish custom. It's, it's a not in any way to say that you know, women aren't part of this either. And we all know that we need women. Yes, we need, we need spiritual women, right? We do. We need spiritual women in our lives. The church needs spiritual women. And the Bible is full of women who are great examples of that. We did a series a while back on women in the Bible. My favorite is Deborah. I mentioned that a while ago. I just think Deborah's the bomb. How do we live this, though? In a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to walk out those doors, and if you turn in your Connect card, you're going to get a Joe Codney's Jesus T-shirt, or possibly on a list for one, because we're probably going to run out, just being honest. But if you turn in your Connect card, we've got something for you. But how do we live it once we get outside those doors? Well, number one, love God. I mean, that sounds simple, right? It's like, that's about a Sunday school answer as you can give, right? Love God. But hang on. Here's what I mean. Really love God. We're in a few weeks. We have a holiday coming up. It's actually my birthday. February 14th, Valentine's Day. <sighs> Fellas. If you haven't done all year long for your wife, you know what I'm saying? 
we need to be doing all year long. Amen? Amen. I'm coming, come on, right? <laughs> he said amen. But our relationship with God is the same way. You know, we, 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 we need to seek him, seek to know his heart. Because here's the deal, if you seek him, the Bible tells us, it's, it's actually very clear that if we pursue him, he, he will reveal himself. He, he promised it. He, he, he's not going to hide himself. We need to make him the center of our decisions. We, we need to seriously, like, I'm not talking about what socks you choose in the morning, right? But the big important stuff, like, he needs to be the center of our decisions and we need to have no other gods before him. Look, the, the, the world system will offer you a false god. I mean, it just, it will. And, you know, I, I know where we live. I'm cognizant of the fact that we, we live in the South, and I grew up in eastern North Carolina, and, you know, I grew up hunting and fishing and, and all those things, even grew up riding horses at my uncle's house, and, and those things are all fun. I love those things. But a hundred years from now, when I'm dead, they're a footnote in my life. The relationship I had with God and then with my family, which, by the way, if you get the one straight, it tends to fix this one. That's going to be the most important thing. People aren't going to ask how many bucks I killed. They're not. Unfortunately, not many. <laughs> Number two, love others. I heard an old pastor years ago say this. He said, we only love God as much as the person we love the least. I was like, oh, I'm hit, <laughs> right? We only love God as much as the person we love the least. So I would say that we need to pray for God to give us his eyes and help us to see people the way he sees people. And we need to live out Romans 12, 18, that says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I'll take it a step further. If you have an issue with a brother or sister, you need to go to them, according to Matthew 18, 15. Because I promise you that becoming bitter towards another person, having hatred in your heart, you've heard it said, and, but it, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I've watched it destroy people. I've watched it destroy ministries. My challenge to us this morning, John gives us an old commandment and a new commandment, a truth to cling to. These are the proof of life this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask you guys, if you will, to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. We're going to kind of wrap things up. The band's going to come moving, begin moving into place. You know, it's a, it's a grand opening, right? It's our grand opening Sunday, and um, many of you, this is the first time we've ever met, and I don't know, maybe you, you just want to try a new church this morning, and maybe it's been a minute since you've been in with all the crazy COVID stuff and all that jazz. But this morning, if God's spoken to you, I want you to do, like I said a minute ago, what you wish you'd done 100 years from now. Don't, don't stay. The altar is open. Maybe you've been holding, harboring a grudge towards somebody that you need to let go of. Maybe it's a people group that, that you need God to help you to, to care for, to, to love. Or maybe you just want to pray with your family. Or maybe you just want to pray for somebody. I want you to know that the altar is open this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with, stand with us, if you will. I'm going to pray for us. And then we're here if you need to do business. Father, thank you for your words. You're a good, good father. You, you challenge us. I appreciate, God, that you don't leave us as we are, that you push us. 
to grow and expand. And I just thank you. And God, I pray for these amazing, beautiful people here this morning. I mean that. These souls that you brought in this house. As you speak, Lord, we will respond in the manner that you want us to respond. That we'll be doers of your word and not hearers only. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We hope you enjoyed today's service. Our heartbeat is to point every man, woman, and child in our area to Jesus. One way we do that is through online services just like this. We want to take a moment and celebrate with Grayson on her decision to follow Jesus in baptism. Grayson grew up in church and always looks forward to Sunday mornings at our Fuquay Verena campus. She loves to worship, serve, and learn about the Bible, but above all, she believes in Jesus with her entire heart. After a year of prayer, this past Sunday, she decided to take a leap in her faith walk and make the decision to confess her faith in front of all her friends, family, and her church. Her parents had the honor of baptizing her and were so excited for all the fruit that will continue to see in her life. If you would like to give to support what God is doing through Point Church, just go to pointchurch.com give and select the online option. These services are supported by viewers just like you. So thank you for helping us point people to Jesus around the corner and around the world. God bless you, we love you, and look forward to seeing you again soon.